Welcome to the Biologically Speaking uh, webinar series. I'm Shaunak, a postdoctoral fellow at the National Cancer Institute, NIH, and also a co-founder of Biologically Speaking, an academic interest group formed by PhD students and postdocs from India, USA, and Europe. If you're tuning to this series for the first time, beyond hosting scientific talks, we also present blog posts for general public. So if you'd like to write for us or share your science story, please contact us via our website, at www.biologicallyspeaking.com. And if you'd like to get updated information on our feature talks, please follow us on Twitter and on YouTube. And all talks are archived on our YouTube channel, so you can visit and listen to the talks anytime you want. We, in Biologically Speaking, believe science is inherently interdisciplinary and collaborative in nature. And today marks the launch of a special series, Crosstalk, where we discuss behind the scenes of collaborations how to initiate and sustain a productive collaborations. In this series, we'll also hear trainees' perspectives along the journey of collaborative work and learning new disciplines. We have partnered with Dr. Mohit Jolly and a professor at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, to put a spotlight on multidisciplinary collaborative efforts being pursued in academic research. Before we begin today's session, a couple of housekeeping things to remind. Uh, please keep your microphone muted and your video turned off during the session. Since this is more of a discussion, we encourage our audience to engage and interact, and you can introduce yourself and directly ask the question, or you can post your questions uh, for our speaker using the chat box, and we will moderate them at the end of today's session. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelist, Professor Sandhya Kaushika, is a neurobiologist from the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Mumbai, and her lab studies traffic within nerve cells called axonal transport. She received a PhD uh, from Brandeis University, followed by her postdoctoral training at Washington University, and moved back to India to start her independent laboratory, first at NCBS Bangalore and currently at TIFR Mumbai. Our next panelist is Professor Gautam Menon, is a theoretical physicist and professor of physics and biology at Ashoka University. He's also a professor and the founding dean of the Computational Biology Group at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at TIA for Mumbai. He received his PhD from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, followed by his postdoctoral work at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai and the Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, and then joined the Institute of Mathematical Sciences Theoretical Physics Group. Professor Menon and Professor Koshika has been collaborating for more than a decade, and today we will hear what drove a theoretical physicist and a neurobiologist to collaborate and what they each gained from it. To aid our conversation in today's session, we'll also hear from Amruta Vasudevan from the Koshika lab at TIF Mumbai, who has recently submitted her doctoral thesis, and along with Reshma Maya, a graduate student in the Menon lab at IMST Chennai, and together we'll discuss the joy and challenges they faced as trainees during this collaboration and bring their perspectives to help the young audience, young and budding scientists in our audience. So without further ado, I'd now like to invite uh, Amruta to introduce their lab's work, uh, followed by Reshma, and they will uh, discuss the research questions they are trying to address with tools available uh, from both the disciplines. So over to you, Amruta. Thank you, thank you, Sean. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right then. Um, thank you so much. Good evening to everyone. And thank you for having us on Crosstalk. Uh, I'll begin by briefly discussing the research interests of uh, Dr. Sandhya Koshka's lab. Let me just move forward. Yeah. Um, so this is simply a schematic representation of a neuron where the cell body is on the left. This portion represents the neuronal process and it terminates in a synaptic putum. And I'm just using the schematic representation to walk you through the broad questions that our lab is interested in addressing. We are a cellular neurobiology lab and we investigate mechanisms underlying axonal cargo biogenesis, their distribution and transport along the neuronal process, and their effect on the neuronal function and organismal behavior with implications for neurodegenerative diseases. So as you can see over here, 
typically investigate questions like how do synaptic vesicles form how do they how uh, how do the right complement of uh, proteins get onto the same vesicle and how is this compartment eventually capable of recruiting the right anterograde motor so that it can exit from the cell body into the axonal process we further investigate things like how do mitochondria distribute along the neuronal process uh how is the anterograde motor steady state distribution maintained along the neuronal process and the implications that it has for its transport properties and how does the motor finally unload from the cargo or how does the motor unload its cargo at synapses and the potential role for the degradation of the anterograde motor in synaptic autophagosome biogenesis at synapses so given that these are the broad interests of the lab i'll briefly touch upon the model system that we used to investigate these questions uh, so our model organism is c elegans and c elegans is a microscopic nematode as you can see from the image on the left and at its adult stage it's roughly about a millimeter long the schematic representation on the right shows the plm neuron which is highlighted in green over here which is our model system of interest and we use this neuron in particular for most of our studies due to several factors a it's positioned right under the hypo, uh, hypodermis and the semi transparent cuticle of the worm and therefore it's readily accessible for imaging techniques the neuron is largely planar and hence you can image a vast portion of its uh, process in one field of view without having to move in z thereby making it very amenable to uh, live imaging experiments this model organism in addition is a hermaphrodite and genetic manipulations and uh, uh, generating transgenic lines is very easy and thereby this is a very attractive and popular model system in which in which to investigate uh, uh cellular neurobiology and biological questions so i'll delve right into the data and all the work that's done leading up to our interdisciplinary work that i'm going to briefly mention and if anybody has any questions or doesn't understand anything please feel free to stop me right in between so the video that i'm showing you right now uh basically uh shows us how uh, shows you all how we trap a live worm in a microfluidic device and use it to then use the trapped worm that's immobilized to then image the neuronal process underneath wherein synaptic vesicles are marked with a fluorophore which is gfp in this case and you can observe their motion along the neuronal process so i'll just play the video now you can have a look at it okay i'm sorry this jumped ahead right so one key feature that i wanted to highlight while playing this video is that you have a population of vesicles that are i'm sorry the video appears to have hung just give me a minute is everybody still able to see the screen yes we can oh uh, i'm sorry for some reason the powerpoint presentation appears to have hung i apologize for the inconvenience i'll just stop share fix the issue and get right yeah no pro no problem
Yes. Uh, is everybody able to see the yes. screen now? Yes, we can see. All right. Yes, perfect. So I'll just move it forward to the part where the neuron appears. And what you can see here, what you're looking at is synaptic vesicle transport in the PLM neuron. And what you observe is that vesicles move in both directions away from the cell body and towards the cell body. And there is a population of vesicles that are stored. So I'll just wait for the video to come right along. Because if I move it forward, it'll hang again. So what you can see is that there is a substantial population of vesicles that are just stationary and do not move in either direction along the neuron process. And this was something that uh, caught the eye of Sandhya and uh, a couple of her students that I'm going, whose work I'm going to talk about in the subsequent slides, which is Paral Sood and Kasalya Murthy. But before that, I just thought I'd show you this uh, image which is basically a transfer CM section of uh, cultured neurons. And uh, essentially, this is to uh, give the viewers an appreciation of the intracellular environment within the axon. Uh, if you see this large structure over here, uh, I'll just use my laser pointer. If you can see this large structure over here, this is representative of a typical cargo that's being transported by this tiny motor along the microtubule track. And all this surrounding uh, structure is neurofilaments and it's representative of the crowded environment that a moving cargo motor complex typically has to traverse along the axon as they move along microtubules. And the image underneath represents a stalled mitochondria. And this is just to give you an appreciation of the scale and the extent of crowding that we are dealing with within the next. Right. So like I said, I'll be talking about the work done by Parul Sood and Kasalya Murthy. And what Parul observed is, if you look at this movie that I'm showing here, the patches that are labeled in green represents actin-rich regions along the PLM neuronal process. And these red circles or punctae that you can see moving along the process are synaptic vesicles. And if you look at the highlighted red arrow, that basically tracks a moving synaptic vesicle that encounters an actin-rich region in green and stalls at that location. So she made the initial observation that moving synaptic vesicles stall at actin rich regions. Uh, her work is now published in traffic and anybody who's interested can, uh, sorry, can check out this paper, which is Sudat all 2018 in traffic. And basically, Parul, uh, I'm walking you through a schematic representation of her key findings, which laid the foundation for our interdisciplinary simulation work. Uh, what she observed is that cargo come and stall at actin-rich regions, which are marked in yellow. However, what she also observed is that regions along the neuronal process that are devoid of actin, but do contain any kind of stalled cargo be it endosomes or mitochondria or synaptic vesicles themselves, can further act as crowded environments that stall other moving cargo. And if you look at a location which has, for example, let's say a stalled mitochondrion and actin-rich region and the presence of other stalled cargo, this essentially constitutes a very crowded location where nearly 80% of all moving synaptic vesicles come in stock. And such crowded locations are quite prevalent along the PLM neuronal process. And this begs the question, so, and mind you, all of these are in wild type healthy neurons. So this observation was really stark and it stood out and we begged the question as to how do you get past traffic congestions in healthy neurons and how is cargo flow maintained in the presence of such crowded locations? 
So this is an example of a kind of question that we are trying to address using simulations. And I'll come back to this. But essentially, when we are interested in asking how cargo transport is maintained in the presence of such crowded locations, it makes sense to examine cargo transport itself in detail along the neuronal process, which is exactly what I'm coming to. Now, if you look at this movie, uh, the data that I'm talking about in this slide is again from Parul uh, and Kirtana, who is a master student in our lab. And basically, if you look at the video that uh, I'm just playing, the two green arrows represent actin patches, which I already showed you in the previous video. And the one moving uh, red arrow, let me just play the video back, represents a moving synaptic vessel. And what you can see is that this is an example of a synaptic vesicle that's moving in one, one direction, encounters a stalled, uh, encounters an actin-rich region, and then changes its direction or reverses and keeps going back and forth between two actin patches. So this was again a very stark in telling observation. And this was characterized in more detail by both Parul and Kirtana in the lab. And if you look, let me switch to the laser pointer mode again. And if you look at this image that I'm highlighting right now, this characterizes two kinds of reversals that we frequently observe along the neuronal process. One is an anterograde reversal, wherein a vesicle that's moving away from the cell body changes its direction and starts moving back towards the cell body. And the other kind is just the opposite which is a retrograde reversal, a vesicle that was moving towards the cell body changes its direction and starts moving away from the cell body. And when uh, both Parul and Kirtana uh, examined the proportion of such events, uh, what they found is that one in every 10 vesicles typically exhibits these kind of reversals along the neuronal process. So the hypothesis now became that perhaps this kind of bidirectional motion or the ability of moving cargo to change the direction of motion could be a potential mechanism by which they bypass or navigate these crowded locations. Now, this again is an example of another question that we uh, address by simulations. And I'll come to that in the subsequent slides. Uh, before that, I'd like to highlight another important observation that came from Parul's work, wherein uh, what she observed was that uh, if you look at the schematic on the top that I'm pointing to right now, you have vesicles stalled at actin-rich regions. These are synaptic vesicles, which are in green. In the unstimulated condition, we are looking at the PLM neuron, which is a touch receptor neuron, and it essentially responds to gentle touch. And when the neuron is unstimulated, you have a low proportion of vesicles emerging from this stalled cluster and moving in either direction. However, when Parul stimulated the neuron repeatedly by uh, gently touching it with an eyelash and then imaged the neuron, what she observed was that the density of these stationary clusters, or rather the number of these stationary clusters along the neuronal process was significantly reduced, which indicated that perhaps in the stimulated condition, you have vesicles mobilizing from these stationary clusters to a higher degree than in the unstimulated condition. And this gave rise to our next hypothesis, which is do stationary synaptic vesicle clusters function as dynamic reservoirs for synaptic vesicles along the neuronal process? So given that these are the questions, these are the nature of the questions that we're looking at, which is uh, how is cargo transport maintained in crowded locations? Can these stationary clusters essentially mobilize in response to signals and contribute significantly to the flux? And can uh, reversals which form a very low proportion of the total events of moving vesicles along the neuronal process, can they have a significant enough role to play in maintaining cargo transport along the neuronal process? These are not questions that can be easily addressed experimentally, 
because uh, we lack the tools or the ability to specifically perturb only, let's say, stationary cargo formation or the frequency of reversals in neurons in vivo without affecting flux in general. So this seemed like an interesting question to address using simulations. And this is where our collaboration with Professor Gautam Menon's group comes in, wherein they essentially uh, developed a coarse grain simulation model using kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, which Reshma will talk about in much further detail right after this. Uh, this is an example video where I'll just play it and I'll walk you through what's happening. They simulated a uh, an axonal process with 10 microtubules, and it essentially reproduces key features of synaptic vesicle transport that we observe experimentally in vivo. And in this simulation, what they've perturbed is the ability of vesicles to change their direction of motion or to switch tracks. And when they do that, essentially they observe that eventually all vesicular motion comes to a halt. And it's only when you allow these state changes or the ability of vesicles to change direction or switch microtubule tracks again, that transport is restored. And this was a very striking result from our simulations. And I'm just representing it graphically over here. And the two key predictions that the simulations provided us with is that one, if you reduce the frequency of reversals, as can be seen in the graph on the left, wherein from left to right, as we move, we are reducing the frequency of vesicles, uh, reversals, sorry. What was observed or what the simulations predict is that you see a steady increase in stationary cluster formation, which is represented by the gray uh, line plot over here. And you see a significant and concomitant decrease in the net anterograde transport of synaptic vesicles. Similarly, uh, and this was a very key finding from the simulation, which is that the locations where these reversals occur may also play an important role in maintaining cargo flow. Wherein as we move from left to right in the graph, on, in the second graph, what we are essentially Altering is the frequency with which reversals occur specifically at crowded locations. So you can have reversals occurring either at crowded locations or at non-crowded locations. And if you specifically decrease the frequency of reversals occurring at crowded locations, what you're once again doing is increasing stationary cluster formation and reducing net uh, anterograde flow of cargo. So another uh, important finding that stands out just by looking at these graphs is the reciprocal nature of stationary cluster formation and net anterograde cargo flow, wherein any perturbation with respect to the frequency of reversals or the location of reversals causes an increase in stationary cluster formation and a decrease in net anterograde flow. And essentially, because these two parameters always uh, are always perturbed in a reciprocal fashion, this strongly suggests from the simulations that your stationary clusters can potentially function as a reservoir, as dynamic reservoirs, and thereby contribute to net anterograde current or flow of vesicles along the neuronal process. So let me just switch out of the laser pointer mode. And so just to briefly summarize about all the work that has been done so far in collaboration, what we observe this is from Parul and Kosalya's data is that traffic jams, or which is here represented by stationary clusters of vesicles along the neuronal process, is a very key feature of the neuronal process. And it's not just a problem or something that's wrong and so, or something that the neuron has not yet learned how to optimize. Uh, an important thing to keep in mind is that if all tracks are blocked physically 
through the presence of obstructions in forms of immovable cargo or microtubule ends, all transport will eventually come to a halt because vesicles will have nowhere to go. In order to prevent such a standstill of cargo flow from happening, there are strategies that the neuron has evolved, namely the ability of vesicles to either switch on to tracks that are less obstructed or not obstructed, or to change the direction of mo motion so that they can sample more of the microtubule space and eventually get onto a track that is less obstructed and thereby bypass traffic jams. And this is essentially to highlight that these are universal principles in transport and they can be translated to multiple different, even uh, problems in the real world. And with this, I'd like to pass it on to Reshma, who will speak about the simulation model in greater detail, if nobody has any questions. Yes, well, thank you, Amruta. Excellent presentation. And great to know that even the neurons get traffic congestions. Uh, so we have a couple of questions, but I think uh, we'll keep that uh, towards the end of the session. And I'll now uh, request Reshma to share their work on using these theoretical simulations. So Reshma, what do you? Yeah. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. Today, uh, I'll be talking about uh, the simulation part of the uh, work we have done with um, Sandhya Kaushika's lab. Uh, our lab mostly works on uh, various biophysical uh, problems and infectious disease modeling. Um, this is the work that uh, a project student with uh, Gautam Vinod had started. and uh, uh, as we had seen uh, from Amrita's presentation, uh, the axonal system is complex and uh, uh, very crowded. But uh, to simulate it, we have made a certain uh, simplifying assumptions. One is that uh, um, we, we model uh, the system on um, 10 parallelly arranged microtubule tracks, uh, with each track being modeled as a 1D lattice with eight nanometers apart, uh, the lattice space being eight nanometers apart. And um, from uh, experiments, uh, we have seen that the uh, vesicles are in three motion states, smooth anterograde, uh, step anterograde, and retrograde. So, uh, uh, they have their uh, a characteristic, uh, they move with characteristic velocity in specific direction, based, uh, depending on the kind of motor that is attached. Uh, we simulate uh, these vesicles uh, in three cargo states, uh, with smooth anterograde and uh, retrograde being uh, states where uh, there's a abundance of either um, kinesin or dynein motors, and step anterograde being uh, having uh, equal numbers of anterograde and retrograde motors. And uh, to replicate the complexity of the axonal system, uh, we we have introduced uh, six my uh, breaks in mitochondria and uh, one one mitochondria uh, spanning three uh, microtubule tracks. And uh, we uh, set some rules for motion of uh, cargo, uh, like um, a cargo at a given a lattice site uh, blocks three sides in, uh, on either side of it. This is owing to the larger size of the uh, vesicle compared to the lattice uh, site and uh, we do not uh, our cargo is blocked by the presence of another cargo uh, or a um, mitochondria or a break um, and when 
a given uh, vesicle is blocked, it can either change its state and move in opposite direction or change its track uh, and go on to a neighboring track. And uh, we, uh, we assign uh, hopping uh, rates to each vesicle based on its type so that uh, the velocity uh, at which the, car, uh, the given type of cargo travels it matches with those uh, seen experimentally. Uh, and we, okay, so we are uh, to simulate uh, this uh, using Monte Carlo um, method, uh, we need to assign uh, certain rules for uh, a motion of uh, cargo. So these are hopping rates and uh, track switching rates, uh, which are uh, benchmarked uh, so as to reproduce certain properties, uh, motion properties, like uh, the uh, ratio of ca uh, cargo in different uh, motion states as seen in the experiment. And uh, we, uh, we use uh, FRAP uh, simulations and compare uh, the properties like uh, T half and uh, the flux in the of cargo uh, to benchmark uh, the uh, track uh, side uh, track switching rate, which is which can't be determined from experiments. Uh, as uh, Amrita has mentioned, uh, the the system is crowded and. Uh, you see uh, stationary vesicle clusters. Uh, now the question is how does the transport is how is the transport still maintained? Uh, so what mechan what mechanisms uh, can the uh, vesicles employ to circumvent the crowding? And uh, two specific mechanisms that we um, uh, tested. Uh, were the reversals and uh, reversals and track switching. Uh, as Amrita had mentioned earlier, uh, both uh, reversals and tra track switching are important in maintaining cargo transport. If either of them are removed, like say a reversal rates are reversals are not allowed, then there is uh, no transport. Uh, the system reaches. Uh, Uh, state where uh, it can't move any further and there is the net current is zero. And when uh, site stepping rate, st stepping rate is set to zero or site stepping is not allowed, the net current uh, drastically reduces. Uh, and uh, the other thing we checked, uh, we tried was to change the uh, reversal rates. What happens uh, if you change the reversal rates? Uh, as Amrita had mentioned, uh, we see a um, reciprocal trend between reversals, net current, and um, uh, stationary clusters uh, densities. Um, and also, uh, the reversal trend is also seen when uh, the locations of uh, reverse uh, reversals are uh, when reversals are changed at uh, certain locations, like at or uh, away from the stationary clusters. Uh, here, as, uh, as Amrita mentioned, there's a reversal, uh, irreciprocal ten trend between uh, reversal rates and uh, net current. Uh, as you can see in the first uh, uh, plot on the left, the number of uh, long-lived stationary clusters increases with decreasing uh, the reversal rate. And the net current decreases with increase in, uh, uh, in decreasing the reversal rate. Uh, yeah. So. Well, thank you, Reshma. Uh, we have a couple of questions, but uh, I'll move on to the scientific uh, journey by Professor Koshika and Professor Menon. And I'd now request uh, Professor Koshika to share your scientific journey. And the question that I'm gonna to ask to both Professor Kaushik and Professor Menon is, uh, they have already 
discussed how the collaboration has started, but if you want to share something, uh, what was that question that seeded uh, this work together uh, and started this collaboration? Uh, over to you, Professor Toshika. So, in this case, I have to say that it was not, you know, the question emerged through discussion. It was not that we wanted to solve a problem. So I think, I want to say it was in 2006 when I went, or maybe 2000, early 2007, when I went to a meeting in IIT Kanpur where I heard Gautam speak about simulations of motors hopping along a lattice. And I realized that there was this approach to looking at biological problems. Up until then, I had never collaborated with anybody who was not a biologist and that I needed to think about it. And, you know, subsequently, I spent time trying to read about those aspects of um, uh, research. And we had this observation in our lab uh, which became experimentally that flux seemed to be regulated differently in different parts of the neuron. And there was not an easy way for me to understand that by just doing what I would call standard biological approaches. And I was wondering if you could do something else. And I remember visiting Gautam in IMSC and showing him our movies and sharing that data. And each time I would show him this movie and this even getting the collaboration off the ground actually took some time where we had to discuss and you know I had to present our data and I had to talk about the questions that we were engaged in and every time he would ask me what are these you know what are these things that you're showing in your chymographs where vesicles are not moving and I always talk about this story when I talk about the story behind the science is that you know that was a well-known phenomena that there are some cargo that don't move but when someone asks you why that happens, you know, you can give the reasons that you think are reasonable or the field things happens. But you begin to realize that there is a deeper question here, which has not been thought about extensively. And what's very striking, I found working with theoretical physicists and Gautam is not the only one, I'm working with another set now, another group of people, Amitabha, uh, Nandi in IIT uh, Bombay and Debashish Chaudhary from Institute of Physics. That approach is one of simplifying. You know, they look at a complex problem and biologists tend to always think about context and what something means and what happens in a particular context. Whereas I often find physicists look at what are common principles much more. Biologists because of the complexity, often gather a lot of data before they make, you know, so we are sure that this is what happens and these are the multiple pathways. And it's a very quickly it will become, you know, these are seven different ways it can happen. So it, for me, Gautam asking me those questions then led me to sort of go back to the lab, convince a postdoc, Kausalya, to do what are very repetitive and very careful experiments and analysis more than we had those data and they needed to be analyzed in many, many different ways. So we would answer the question one way, which Gautam asked and we take it back and Gautam said, have you thought about it like this? And that means another month or two of just doing analysis on existing data. And with time, with these discussions in person, over phone, um, I think the story began to emerge as to what the question was and how we would go about answering it. So I think it was a very gentle start. It was not something that, you know, it's like, this is what we're going to answer and go along with it, but more a conversation which took place over time. For me, it was very useful because I learned a lot. I learned how physicists think about questions. And now if I go to some sort of computational talk or theory talk, I'm not lost and I, I owe, I owe that understanding to the long years it took for it to go start and for Gautam's patience in explaining things to me. No, that's great. Thank you, Sandhya. Um, I, think that, I think that's very important to actually learn a new discipline and then implement that to our own research questions to expand our, uh, our research. 
I now request Professor Menon uh, to say a few words uh, and the overall scientific journey and the collaboration. It was interesting to listen to Sandhya describe how we began. And if her memory is right, we, I think we first met at that meeting at IIT Kanpur, which looked at traffic across multiple different types of systems. And Sandhya was describing the biological end of traffic, when motor transport is biological traffic. But there were other talks about, you know, ant trails and, and vehicular traffic, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea behind that meeting was to say that, look, here are lots of examples of different things. Here are models for these various types of phenomena. And you know, let's just think about, is there a common trend, a common un an understanding that we can make out of all of this? So I don't know whether sort of other people also profited from this at that meeting, but both of us took that message back. And this is certainly our first meeting. And one thing she didn't mention is that we did organize a meeting together in Pondicherry that looked at, at, at motor transport there. This is in part of a sequence called the M2T2, or the Molecular Motors Transport and Traffic Meeting, a series that combined many other people, both biologists, and slowly an infusion of people who came from theoretical physics or from modeling or from engineering together with that. So exactly as she describes, I mean, so I, I'll tell you where I came from, because again, this might interest your, your, your audience. So it's not as though I hadn't collaborated with experimentalists before. I had by then worked for several years with people who looked at experimental data in physics, in different types of physics problems, especially in low temperature physics, superconductivity, etc. But it took, so it was not unfamiliar, looking at data was not an unfamiliar act for me. Talk to experimentalists was not an unfamiliar act. What was very unfamiliar was my un, sort of the understanding that I came to very slowly of the complexity of biological data, of the difficulties of doing experiments, of the difficulties of you know, just accumulating enough data for it to make statistical sense and to be able to understand out of the vast number of explanations for what might be happening, what was the right one or what could potentially be the right one. That I think is an important lesson for people who work in physics to try and understand that biology is not like the rest of physics. The rest of physics, we know, you know, the sort of physical laws are very well known and described. You can do extremely precise experiments. Typically, or we don't, don't bother to quote error bars in physics experiments because those error bars are negligible given the quality of the, of the experimental measurement that you do, the fact that you can take it to very low temperatures, where there are no sort of no noise at all in the measurements that you make. You can repeat your experiment about 10 million times as, as much as you want. It's not time consuming in that sense to generate data of quality. But all those rules are upended completely when it comes to biology. And these experiments are very difficult. They're very time consuming. They're very noisy. There are many things that you, it, it's hard to control the many different types of effects that could possibly be at play. And to finally to be able to spin a story out of that is complicated. So after that meeting, you know, again, as Sandhya says, it took a long, long, long time. And much of this time was really devoted to my asking dumb questions. Sandhya asked me good questions about, you know, about how modeling is actually done. And, and we just, and, and, you know, it's, it's again, the other issue that people who come from outside biology face is the, the, the just names of things. You know, why, why should a protein which has an identical function in two different model systems have two different names? And how am I supposed to remember all of this in order to have a conversation about what's actually going on? So as Sandhya says, the move towards representing something in simpler form, which is something that physicists naturally do, to try and say that, let me just strip out all of the detail that you want and let me get the simplest possible approach to understanding the system that you're interested in. That was one step that both of us had to move together. I had to learn some of the terminology and some of the experimental detail. She had to simplify for me the, the names of the terms and say, look, don't worry about this name. This is what it actually happens. What happens at the core of this experiment? Here are the errors. This is what we don't know. This is what we do know. And that development of a common language was, I think, an important part of it. And I think both of us have profited from that and being able to talk now to other people with the foreknowledge, with the, with the advanced knowledge of the fact that we know what to say. We know how to pose our questions. We know how to describe our context. And that, that certainly made a difference. As so we wrote an article also together for India Bioscience that summarized what it meant to think in, in, in an interdisciplinary manner about a particular problem in biophysics. And we that article got a lot of traction. I can recommend it to people who are interested in this in these questions. And uh, the sort of the, the thing I will take away from that is that being interdisciplinary is hard, it's difficult, it takes a lot of work. And it's good to concentrate on long-term problems that, as Sandhya says, you know, may not may have been ignored a little bit because people tend to take things for granted. 
And this is true of a lot of science, not just biology, that you, you tend to take really hard questions often don't get answered. People think they've been answered, but they've not really been answered to, to what, if you go deeper and deeper, you find a cloud of words that describes it and people have said something and they may be right, they may not be right, but we really don't know. So those are interesting questions because they really are the harder questions. They're the questions that by mutual agreement, people in the community have decided to step away from because they look too hard and they construct a cloud around it, suggest that maybe they understand it, but they actually don't. And certainly the questions around external transport are such questions. Why do stationary clusters form? An old observation, 30 years old. That's again a question. What is the nature of the regulation that goes into that? Where do these clusters form? Why don't they just block external transport completely and thereby kill that particular neuron? What, what are the mechanisms that are in place? Are these biophysical? Are these primarily physical mechanisms? Or are they biological mechanisms? Or are there some interesting combination of both of these things? So that's where we're at and you know, we've sort of now collaborated for a fair amount in, in, this, in this particular area. And you know, we've also gone on to do other problems, but I think this has been particularly useful in the sense that it's actually been confronting models with data and keeping models honest by looking at data, but also not concentrating on the minutiae of the data, but trying to understand what the larger picture is. And that's really what we've been trying to do. Yeah. That's, that's what I had to say. No, thank you. Thank you, Professor Menon, and, uh, for sharing this. And I think I'll quote what Martin Schwartz has once said, that stupidity in scientific research is very important. So asking those dumb questions might be the important things to move forward. And with that note, I'll also encourage all our audience to ask questions to this session. And uh, you can ask about the scientific research talk that Amrut and Reshma has given, or in general, how collaborations are initiated and any tips for uh, for being a successful collaborator. With that, I'll now request Amruta and Reshma to join the panel discussion and also request all the panelists to keep our videos turned on if possible. And I think Amruta has already answered a lot of questions in the chat box, I see, but I'll ask Amruta if you want to uh, say a few more uh, that you would like to tell to our audience regarding the questions. I just wanted to add to what Gautam said, and then I'm taking to over. I think I have um, one of the side benefits in not only being able to now talk to people who are, you know, physicists who think about problems slightly differently than biologists. I think the biggest beneficiary is that I have become a better science communicator. Because just by force of habit, you know, having to sort of simplify things. I mean, I always looked at science in that way. What's the simplest way to convey it? But I think that has been a very important side benefit. I don't have anything more to add. Uh, Amrita. Oh, yeah, let me, let me second that. Absolutely. Very important point to make. Right. Uh, I, I think there's only one question left that's addressed to me, uh, which is from Hasati. Uh, do these traffic jams benefit neuronal function in the worm in some way, or are they detrimental to them? Uh, I think, uh, so I'll address it in the most simple manner that I can. Uh, we currently do not have a way to say whether these traffic jams benefit neuronal function in any way. However, we have seen the other extreme, which is if these traffic jams increase, uh, and we, uh, this is data from Kirtana in the lab, uh, wherein she essentially examined a neurodegenerative disease model in worms. Uh, so it was a taupathy model wherein neurons get excessively crowded as the worm ages. And in these exceptionally crowded neurons, essentially what we observed, what she observed was that the net anterograde transport of cargo was significantly diminished and most moving synaptic vesicles essentially stalled and formed these really long lived stationary clusters. And that was detrimental to neuronal function. So while we do not as yet know what reduction in traffic jams would specifically do to neuronal function, we have definitely seen that an increase in them 
is strongly correlated with poor neuronal function. And uh, I'd ask Sandhya and Gautam to add anything. No, thanks, thanks, Amruta. I think we'll start a question uh, from Dr. Mohit Jolly to Amruta and Reshma. Can you please share some frustrating moments and experiences as a part of the collaboration? Frustrating moments. Oh, <laughs> okay. Think about this for a bit. Reshma, oh, maybe I will. No, no, I will say, Amrita, I think you're feeling a bit shy. <laughs> saying, it's no, never no, no. ending, <laughs> never ending addressing reviewers' comments. <laughs> yeah. so I think this re addressing reviewer comments would be something that's common to any scientific work, be it interdisciplinary or not. <laughs> But yes, yes, I suppose yeah. That's that's an additional challenge with uh, such papers uh, is that uh, essentially you are held to a uh, quite a high standard in order to make the case. And how do you essentially prove that your model is essentially reproducing or producing what you say it does? Are you interpreting it correctly? You have to be careful with things like that. So I suppose in that sense, it requires some uh, additional thought and quite a bit of work. But I wouldn't necessarily say that's frustrating, per se. Uh, it's part of the process. Um, but uh, I suppose in uh, matters like this, what could get... Uh, Frustration, uh, frustrating eventually is perhaps the repeated back and forth because not all aspects of the work are entirely under your control. Uh, so, so not only is the understanding of the other aspects of the work limited, but uh, your, con your access to the work, your ability to just play around with things is also limited depending on well your inclinations if that's something that you like then that could potentially be frustrating that's, what I'd say. Well, that's great Amrita. yes yes Professor Man. i just want to point out the elephant in the room which is the pandemic i mean i think there is no graduate student no collaboration <laughs> no faculty member in the country who has not been frustrated by the pandemic in the last year and a half, in two, two years, two and a half years. And that has certainly set many research trajectories and many research careers that set it back by an equivalent amount. That's certainly been a huge source of frustration for many people. We should recognize that and realize that we have to figure out ways to get beyond that. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Reshma, do you want to share uh, some of your thoughts? Um, yeah, like... Uh, we were, uh, like Amrita pointed out, with the re responding to reviewer comments, like, why did you not choose a, a complex model than what you have chosen or more, a simpler model? So as one of the questions uh, here asks, like, they, they basically ask the same thing, like, how do you uh, simplify a complex system, like, uh, the biological system, yeah. So basically, how do you uh, choose the parameters or the choices you're making to build the model? Yeah, that's the uh, difficult. Okay, so I'll so take a question. Yeah. I, I want to just add something to this because I have sort of seen from the experimental end a fair number of, fair number of students go through this journey. And what I noticed, the two things. So we we have had many different interdisciplinary collaborations with chemists, with engineers, uh, with experimental physicists and theoretical physicists. And, but it doesn't matter who you collaborate outside your field with. The level of repetition experimentally, which as all of you view, anybody who's here as an experimentalist, you know that it's a craft and sometimes an art. And it's not as if that you get super reproducible data every time. And sometimes your strain drifts and things don't behave right. And I've seen that irrespective of the nature of interdisciplinary work, because you're really at the forefront of not knowing how, you have no prediction of what you'll get at the end of it at all. 
you know, you might have some feel for it, but you really don't have that addiction. So I would say that that repetition is something you need tremendous resilience and determination to carry through. Day after day, week after week, doing that. You know, you, I mean, my most, our most recent uh, collaboration was with, um, as I said, with Amitabha and Devashish and Vidur, who's a student in the lab who's doing it. I think some of the FRAP experiment he may have done hundred times, changing different conditions because it wasn't, you know, the it was not fitting with the model. We couldn't understand it. And then finally, you know, some other thing which he had done, he said, let's fit it with that. And then things began to fall in place, right? And that repetition for a biologist can be extremely, student can be extremely frustrating because you can't move ahead. You are stuck and you're seeing your time clock running out in terms of funding, in terms of, at the same time, you know that, you know, if you care to do, if you've engaged with the process, it's usually because something about that process is fun. And with the exception of Reshma, who has not spent a lot of time in my lab, usually what I tend to do for any interdisciplinary collaboration, the student who's in the other lab, I request them to spend time in our lab. So, you know, because they will bring something to the group because they will express their views and their scientific thoughts in a way in which, you know, people in my lab may not be familiar with. And also, I think they then begin to see what it means when they say, you know, we need like a little bit more data over here. What does it take from our group to get that data? And then at this point of time, I would say fairly with both Reshma and uh, and Amrita, Gautam and I are not involved very much. Now, a lot of the communication they do on a daily or weekly basis with each other. And that's what you, in the end, you want, because that is a hallmark of scientific maturity, right? Because they can now discuss and small solve all their little problems together. And in this case with Reshma and, and Amrita, it has all happened online pretty much. But in the past, it used to happen by this sort of collaborative agreement where people would come and spend some time in my lab rather than the other way around. No, I think that's very important. I mean, that was one of my questions to ask, like how do you actually uh, collaborate when you are physically apart from uh, like within different states in India? But yes, I mean, it's great to know that uh, grad students can actually visit each other's lab and learn new disciplines and also contribute to their own, own research group. I'll take a question from one of the audience, Krishnamurti Srinivasan. Uh, fantastic work indeed. Correct me if I'm wrong, but building the model for the simulation seems incredibly complex. And I think as one of the most pivotal part of the computational work, given the contrasting backgrounds the labs come from, how much to and fro did it take before both the lab were able to reach a consensus point in this regard? Can you provide us some insights as to how you reached the same? A long, 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 long time. And I think it sort of helps that we, we had sort of tenorish positions by the time we, we sort of got to seriously working on a long-term basis together. And, uh, but that, I mean, it's, it's really impossible to imagine that happening as comprehensively as it did on a much shorter time scale. There was a lot of, of, of back and forth, a lot of figuring out what had to go into the model. And uh, what is it that we needed to convince ourselves about, about the questions that we wanted to address. And uh, I think uh, Deshma mentioned motion states, I think, in what she said. And that's, again, how many different types of motion states can a vesicle have? How is that related to the number of motors that are transporting it? What is the nature of, of that description? How many microtubules should you have if you want to at least get a reasonable description of what's going on? How do you account for stuff that people have never accounted for before? For example, breaks in the microtubule along which transport is happening, big cargo, other types of cargo, which is slow moving along the microtubule, for example, mitochondria. How do you put those factors in all of the you know, actin accumulations, all of the other complexities that in a sense biologists know about and take for granted? But when it finally comes to the step of translating that into something that is a model from which you hope to extract results that look like the biological problem, that becomes hard. So really, I think you know, I, I used many longs in my description of took a long time, but I think that every long was justified. It really takes a long time. We were doing this for the first time and that I think really made a difference. I would say, I would say the single biggest thing is 
how well do you want to understand the question? I think if we just wanted to bring something to a completion and publish something, we could have done it much earlier. But I think the bottom line was how deeply did we want to understand what we were trying to un- trying to figure out. And I should say that for for me, it you know what Gautam said, for instance, mitochondria or actin. You know, I remember telling him at one point and saying that, you know, we've taken these microtubule endings and now we should model in actin because that was what uh, Padu's data was suggesting. And then he said yes. And then he came back and then he said, you know, it really wouldn't make a difference. And this was the reason it would make a difference when the model would hold through because it's after all probability. It took me time, and despite having at that point worked with him for four or five years, it took me time to understand that. And I think, you know, the state changes that Reshma described, for me to sort of think about it as local decisions, think about it as spatial relax, you know, spatial ways to solve the problem or temporal ways to solve the problem. I also needed time to sort of think about that simulation and understand what that meant and how I should think about it going forward. It does not matter whether it informs my next research question, but really in terms of insight, what have we gained? So that entire process, it's not just the model, it's what you get from it. And how deep do you want to go to get from it? And some of it may not even end up necessarily in a paper, but it is your own understanding of what is happening. Here, we picked a problem in axonal transport. And I think to get to that level, I think you need, you need that engagement over time, over more than one generation of students. Because otherwise the focus often is becoming, let's just solve this problem and get this out. No, that's good. I think we are running out of time, so I'll go to the last question of uh, to the session. Your, uh, this is a question to all the panelists. Your thoughts on uh, choosing the right scientific collaborator for a particular question, and how do you manage time? Uh, because you have your own lab's work, and also you can talk about uh, authorship issues with uh, when you're uh, writing your papers for, for scientific publications. And by that, we can wrap up to this session. Let me go first and then Sanjay can go, can go after okay. that. Okay. Every collaboration is very different. And I think in this case, I mean, the collaboration that Sanjay and I had is also, I mean, we're both professional collaborators, we're also friends apart from that. So that allows for us, for example, to discuss authorship issues and other questions in a different way than you might. I mean, it's a much more collegial way rather than an antagonistic way when we come to it. It's not necessary for a, for a collaboration to be structured like that, but it helps in other ways. It really helps you get along with people who you work with. That is one thing. Time management, I mean, I'm always envious of how Sandhya manages her time, her students, the attention that she devotes to them. I'm much worse at that. And the pandemic has thrown me completely for a six because our own interests have expanded and diverged into different areas. I work now much more in diseases than I do in traditional biophysics. I work in other areas of biophysics. So I've been very bad at really managing my time. So the other bit of advice I can use, don't be like me. Manage your time better, manage more time more responsibly. And that I think is, is very important if you want to do, you have to assign time, assign responsibilities, but it also helps. I mean, when I say that, you know, Sandhya and I talked about this, we did this, et cetera. Again, I don't want to downplay the extremely important efforts that the students and the project assistants who worked on this did really, really rode on their backs with Vinod, who the project assisted with Reshma later on, on both this and another problem. Most of the time, and apart from the initial point of, look, I would like to see this happen, I would like to do this, and they went off and implemented this in the computer code that they were writing, we fine-tuned it many times, but the hard work that went into it was really there, and we could just sit back and say that, look, here's our pipe dream of what we'd like to see, and that's again important for, for PIs to realize that, I mean, PIs do know this, but to sort of remind themselves from time to time that, you know, they may, they may look, they may get to give the, the cards for presentations and the talks, etc., but the hard work is really done by the people who are the students who, who really do this. And at the end of it, ideally, it's their problem. They know it better than anyone else. 
they know the literature that went into it, they write the thesis, they write the papers, etc. And what we do is to provide the broad outline, the broad thoughts behind it, the little checks, the sanity checks, the links that, they, that you might see that only come from, from experience. But apart from that, not too much. Yeah. Thanks. So I think it doesn't matter what the collaboration is whether you're friends or not, one thing is which is essential, two things which I think are essential is scientific trust and generosity. And by and large, I've had that with every interdisciplinary collaborator. And what I mean by scientific trust is that you basically open the entire box and you show the whole mess of your thoughts which are not formed, and your data, which is all over the place, both. You share openly everything because that allows the other two investigators, which is two well-trained minds, and keep the young people in the room. My best collaborations have always been when the young people, the students, are part of these conversations and see these discussions. In fact, with Gautam and I, we would both sort of edit the paper and Paru used to be in the room. And when we have discussed, everybody is there and we are all, so you know that there's that openness that you build. And the other thing is generosity. I often talk about one of my collaborators, uh, Venkat Raman, who was in physics, in the physics department at ISC. And his student Siddharth would come and work with us. We were developing microfluidic pillar devices, which is really a problem which I wanted to solve is how much force was the animal experiencing or applying when it moved for a completely different project actually related somewhat to what Gautam and I were working on. And when the first draft of the manuscript which Siddharth wrote came, Venkat was on the paper, but he was not a corresponding author. He had made Siddharth put me as the last and corresponding author. And I called him up and he said, I don't agree, Siddharth is your student. And you gave an enormous amount of input as well. And, and you know, and I think this is always, this is what I've always believed is that that generosity of spirit is very important because it keeps the, keeps it open. And of course there's discussion, right? So I've had people, including postdocs who have been engaged with it say that, you know, we we think this is not the way it should be. So if you hear everybody out, respond to everything, but even that should be discussed openly with everybody who's involved. So you sort of come up with something which is represents the contributions of everybody to that story. And I think that's enormously important. And I have never collaborated so far with someone where I've not had that scientific trust because I would not even take the next step, right? I would not even try to set up that collaboration without that. No, I think that's very important. Thanks, Raza Uh Amruta and Reshma, do you want to say, before we close to this session, uh, one key things that you've been immensely uh, benefited out of this collaboration and your tips to future grad students who will be a part of these kind of collaborations. Uh, yeah, sure. I've, I've always been uh, interested in uh, computational modeling and theoretical modeling, and this was always the direction that I wanted to go in. So uh, this essentially has been my primary window to that space. So for that, I'll always be grateful. And uh, the only thing I'd suggest to other grad students is with projects like these, you, whatever else you do or don't do, you have to take it, you have to have some amount of patience to stick with it to the end, which Sandhya also pointed out requires a lot of resilience. Uh, so yeah, eventually all the learning and the growth that happens with time. And as you sit and marinate with the data, you do, it comes more naturally to you. So I think you definitely have to do it sincerely and with patience. That's what I suggest. No, thanks, Amrita. Uh, I, I do agree with Amrita. Like patience is something uh, it's vital in 
uh, collaborations like this because uh, they have their own terminologies. You think uh, it, uh, you don't know if you're on the same page. So it takes a lot of back and forth to arrive at that. So, yeah. So that's good. Thanks, Reshma. Well, we're running out of time. I mean, we have taken more than an hour, but we truly thank all our panelists, Professor Koshika, Professor Menon, Amruta, and Reshma for sharing your thoughts, your research projects, and we wish you all the best for your research. And I think we have all greatly benefited from this conversation. Uh, thanks to our audience for asking some fantastic questions. And please stay tuned and follow us on social media platforms to get updates on our Teacher session. We are currently funded by the Women in Bio Initiative uh, at Chicago. Uh, so truly thankful for their uh, support. And Mohit, uh, Dr. Mohit Jolie, it's his brainchild, and we are just initiating this here. And I now request Dr. Mohit Jolie to uh, share some concluding remarks and we close today's session. Uh, Mohit, if you're around. So there is. Mohit, can you hear us? Uh, unmute. I think you should be able to unmute. Can you hear me, Sonak? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great, great. Thank, thanks so much, Sonak, and thanks so much, Sandhya, Gautam, Reshma, and Amrita for this fantastic session. Um, I, I learned a whole lot, and thank you so much for sharing the parts of the journey so candidly and such valuable advice to both um, young PIs such as myself as well as uh, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows involved in such uh, long-term collaborations. Yeah, and the whole idea uh, behind the series was that we often get to hear talks from one of the PIs or in very rare cases both of the PIs at the same instance thanks to the um, initiative of M2T2 kind of meetings whereas Gautam pointed out there is enough invasion by physicists um, uh, currently to allow for that uh, dialogue um, but we don't get to hear about the personal aspects of things and, and what uh, traits uh, in terms of both professional etiquette as Sandhya was talking about uh, as well as trust um, and frustration that uh, are key components of any collaborations including the interdisciplinary ones uh, so thank you so much for sharing that and um, I together with Chanak uh, this series hopefully continues and we get to learn uh, much more about other additional examples. And I wanted the series to start with Sandhya and Gautam because their articles that they talked about have shaped my own thinking in a whole lot of um, thinking about such collaborations. And the reason I asked that frustration question is because I do get many of my students complain about that they are being frustrated. And I have no way to address it right now. So I'll talk to you separately to try to uh, mitigate those situations. But thank you so much once again. And this was a great uh, learning experience. And thanks so much, Shanak. Thanks, Moet. Uh, Sandhya has already shared these articles in the chat box. And I have read those and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. So I'll strongly encourage all our audience to uh, go through them. Uh, with that, thank you everyone for joining and for Crosstalk Series. Stay tuned for the next session next month. With that, thank you again for joining. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.